Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show. And um, it's actually take two of this entire episode because somehow I didn't hit a little record button on my remote. I thought I did, and I didn't see a little red dot over my head telling me we we're recording. So we're going to start over again. But that's okay. I can tell you right off the bat, all three wines are good. <laughs> all right. So um, let's just get started again. I cannot believe I just did that. All right, so first wine is, uh, I got all these wines from Ceci Barreto at Venusly Speaking. Now, she recently had a wine and food pairing um, for Thanksgiving wines, and I let her know I wasn't able to make it, so um, I told her I would uh, stop by later the next week and pick up, these, pick up some wine. So she had a bunch of wines she suggested, and these are the three that I chose. So the first wine is the... Uh, 2011, sorry, 2012 Castello do Papa Godeo for 15 bucks. Um, this is a wine from Spain. This is from the Galicia area of uh, Spain. Now that is the northwestern part of Spain, right above Portugal. And it's also kind of famous for the Rias Baixas area, which is, produces a lot of Albarino. So Godeo is the grape, and uh, this is 100% Godeo. And this is something that uh, she suggested because of the, you know, for starting off lighter fare for Thanksgiving, set your salads and stuff like that. Um, and if you're maybe doing seafood. So we're going to, I already know what all these wines taste like and smell like, so uh, nothing's going to be really a surprise. I'm just going to reiterate everything. So first of all, let's check it out on the nose. And these wines might have improved since then too. All right, so um, on the nose, uh, get more of a lime rather than any type of lemon with the citrus. Um, also got this sweet tart type of uh, aroma to it. Still get that. But I also get kind of a, now I get kind of this almost like a Sauvignon Blanc quality, not, not with the cat pee or the, or the lemons, but uh, oh, actually more like a, almost like a, an Albarino, like a seashell, uh, almost a salinity like, you know, ocean type of thing to it. And, and a little bit of green apple. Um, so, uh, oh, should have opened that back up. Anyway, so yeah, get a little bit of green apple on it. Now that's, um, uh, that's pretty typical. Here we go. That's what I'm looking for. Um, Apparently it's pretty typical with this varietal. Now I found some information about this. Now the um, the actual winery is Ladera Sagrada, and uh, in the Valladoras Do or uh, that Do is the like Doc in Spain, and Valladoras is in the south eastern part of Galicia. So um, the gentleman who's the winemaker, Pedro Alvarez, uh, apparently was in uh, the D.C. area, I think, or wherever this gentleman is from. Uh, I found this information, interesting enough, from a, a um, website called The Passionate Foodie. So I'll have a link to him uh, below, and because uh, it was really hard to find anything really about the winery itself. But in 2007, um, they had, uh, they, I guess they had uh, some Spanish winemakers come over uh, to this um, uh, wine shop, and this gentleman was one of them. And uh, all the wines are, uh, at least all the vines are at least 25 years old. They also make wine from another grape called Men Mencia, or Mencia, uh, which is the other main grape in the Valadoris uh, Dio. So um, they talked about getting green apples. They also talked about getting uh, pear, and I didn't get any pear on this. But the minerality is confirmed like with that kind of that crushed seashell type of thing. 
and, and the apple isn't as strong as it was initially when I first smelled the wine. Now let's see what it had tastes like. Again, very mineral like, almost chalky. That was something I picked up last time with the wine. Really chalky. Um, I do get the green apple, but it's there's still a lot of acidity to it. Um, I don't really get pear, but I can kind of see there's like a there's almost like a almost a sweet tar, you know, sweet tart, a little sweetness to it. Um, but uh, it's not as it's still very acidic, not as acidic as when I first had it, but still really acidic. Um, and this is going to be something I really think that will go great with uh, salads. Um, I, spinach salads all the time. But like if you had little, those little mandarin oranges to this, not to the wine, but to the salad, that would be cool. Not too Thanksgiving-y, I, I don't think, but it would be kind of a really like, you know, nice uh, accompaniment to the salad. Um, if you had some cranberries into the salad, I think that would go great with the flavor profile with that, especially if you get the little bit of apple with the, uh, with the wine. Um, if you had like a fruit salad of some sort, uh, or even starting off with a cheese plate and you had some fruit on it, uh, or even just, you know, getting some dried cranberries uh, to, to go with this. I think that'd be awesome. And if you're, if you're going to do some seafood, I mean, seafood is going to be a natural pair with this. Um, uh, it, it just, it gives you the element of, of, um, of fish and, and being near the sea. And it's also, not that the grape is, is related to it, but Rias Bachas and, and being the, the main area for Alborino up in that part of Spain, um, that's another one of those grapes that just screams having something like seafood with it. So, and has, and tends to, people feel there's a salinity to it. I don't get a lot of salinity to this wine, but, you know, it, there's, there's almost like a, when I smell it, there's almost like this, um, not carbonation to it, but, you know, it, 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 almost like an effervescence of some sort, even though there's no bubbles in the wine, there's no gas in it. It's really nice. I like it a lot. Um, if you can really find it, I would totally go with it. It's got that lime more than anything else apple. I don't really get the pear like, like this gentleman got, but, um, it's really good. Um, really refreshing too. I mean, this could be a great summer wine too, but like I said, you are starting off the, the dinner. This is a good palate. Um, this is a great way to get the palate started because the acid is going to make that mouth water. And that's one of the great things about acid. That's how, you know, there's a lot of acid in the wine. If your mouth is watering a lot from drinking wine, it's because there's a lot of acid to it. So this is a great thing to get the appetite started, get the juices flowing, literally. Um, you're starting off with something light and then you can move into the heavier fare. So totally awesome stuff. All right, so moving on to wine number two. Now this wine I bought, a lot of I bought because of a little backstory oh, that Ceci told me. And we'll get to that in just a second here. But um, it's a Pinot Noir, one of the other big reasons why I bought it, because Pinot Noir is a very traditional Thanksgiving wine. This is the 2011 Cartilage and Brown Pinot Noir from the North Coast. Now, um, I do have to admit that I'd never heard of Cartilage and Brown until I bought the wine, which is not good because, one, they've been around since 1980. Uh, they've been around their... Their philosophy is trying to make, you know, good value wines, uh, good quality wines for good value. Uh, and, and the wine is balanced. It's supposed to taste like it should. It's supposed to, you know, everything's supposed to be not, not clinically correct. Not, not, it's not like some cookie cutter wine, but it's, it's meant to evoke the wine the way it's supposed to be. Um, now, one of the things about this wine is that uh, back in the day uh, when Robert Parker was, you know, writing wine reviews, um, he apparently would he would finish off his article talking about that he's going to go back to, he's going to uh, get back to his cartilage and brown. So this was one of his everyday drinking wines. So if Robert Parker thinks it's a good wine, then it must be pretty good. So um, uh, it's a fifteen dollar bottle uh, that I got. Well, fifteen at, at Ceci's shop. 
So it's a good value. Um, it's not 10 bucks and under, but you know, while there's some really good $10 and under wines that are out there, you got to start getting above 10 to 50. You got to get to 10 to 15 to start getting something that's got a little more, feels like there's a little more quality to it. Trust me, there's some $10 wines that are steals, $8 wines that are steals, especially when we're talking from, uh, from places like South America and Portugal. Uh, you can get some phenomenal wines uh, for under 10 bucks. But for a California Pinot Noir, that's something that um, you're probably going to have to spend a little bit more than $10 to get something that's really good quality. Now, one of the things I do want to mention is that it really is like a Pinot Noir, and this is 100% Pinot Noir. The other one was 100% Godeo, by the way, um, which that means is that it's see-through. And I really like that when California wines, Pinots, do that. Um, it means it's see-through. It means they didn't put anything other grape in there that's got a little more color to it to add more color to the wine itself. Um, a lot of times, Americans want you know deeper color, and Pinot Noirs you know, if it's 100% Pinot Noir, it's not meant to be that way. So, um, but it is California, so it's not expected to drink like a Burgundy. It's not expected to drink like an Oregon wine because they're kind of in between Cali and, and uh, France. So let's dive into this. Now, the benefit of that I had to do this a second time, besides that I've already formulated all my opinions on the wine, which is the first time ever in the 284 episodes that I've done this, where I've, especially if I, that I've had the wine just a few minutes ago, um, is that if an apparent fault in a wine surfaced during the recording uh, and I talk about it, um, it may have disappeared by the time I re-record this. So I'll tell you that, and I'm, it's not to hide it, but I'll tell you that um, when I first smelled the wine and taste a little bit, I felt like I had some what's called volatile, volatile acidity to it, um, or it's called VA, which uh, in, in large amounts can be considered a flaw or a fault of the wine. Now I can tell you right now, I don't get any of that. So this is something where when you open a bottle of wine, sometimes that initial smell, that initial taste is gonna be off-putting just because it just, it's, it's what was contained in the bottle. And then, you know, it's like airing out the house, okay? It's like, you know, you open up a, a shed that hasn't been open in a while, you gotta air it out a little bit. So, same idea with this is that it needed a little bit of breathing time, uh, need a little more interaction with, with air. So, I don't get that at all, So, which is nice. Because, I, because while I did recommend the wine, because during the tasting it got better, uh, it's it's good that it's even better now. It's like non-existent, so that's good. So what's, what does it smell like besides that? Well, I get a little bit of earthiness to it. Um, it's not fruit forward. It doesn't have an abundance of cherry that you can expect from a Pinot Noir. And maybe because it was, it's been out for a little bit. I'm having a hard time getting a lot more out of it. But it's, it, it's, it's a little bit of cherry. It's a little bit, not woodsy, but a little bit earthy. But not a whole lot on the nose. And I felt like the first time it had more to it on the nose. But it's really light. So let's check out the flavor. All right, so it's light, like it should be. Um, it's really got a tartness to it, a sour cherry to it. Um, it's got a good acidity to it. My mouth's watering. Um, it's, it's, I would think it's closer to what you expect from an Oregon Pinot Noir than a California Pinot Noir. Um, and that Cali Pinot Noirs tend to be a little fruitier, um, but they're, and Oregon Pinot Noirs will have elements of fruit, but they're not typically as, earthy um, as, as, a, as a burgundy. Um, I, they're, they're, 
Tasty Notes mentioned something about mushroom and all that. I didn't get any mushroom either time, um, but there's a little bit of cherry to it. Um, they also mentioned some other, uh, other things, like they mentioned raspberry. I didn't get any raspberry to it, but um, you know, it's, it's really smooth. Um, the second time around, I feel it's a better wine, but it's really light. So I did, uh, I, uh, they talked about cinnamon in it. I was like, I didn't get any cinnamon at all, but I can see, and one of the things I still see with this is pairing it with ham, a little honey baked ham with the cloves on it. Because even though I don't get cinnamon, there is a bit of a spice to it but I think it would really complement it. It's a little earthy, not earthy, but woodsy. It feels like there's a little bit of wood to it. Um, but if you get that kind of a rustic type of food to it, I think it'll pair really well. Again, light foods, uh, turkey with the typical gravy and the cranberries and all that uh, will work really well with it. Um, they also talked about venison on their, on their tasting notes. I think it'll go great with venison. Uh, again, something a little more rustic. They talked about lamb and, and veal. I'm sure it'll go great with that too. But you know, if, if you're if you're if you went out and did a little hunting, got a little venison, you know, for Thanksgiving, that might go great with it. So I mean, I really think you got some good stuff, like um, more like some sausage with some mustard on it. I think it'd be great with that too. I know not traditional Thanksgiving, but you know that type of you know flavoring to it. So if you're using like some maybe not like mustard, but like some dry mustard, uh, maybe a dry mustard rub, maybe you're doing prime rib with it. That would go pretty decent with this, especially with the type of rub that you're doing. Um, so yeah, I really like the wine. This is good stuff. Good stuff. Glad Ceci um, suggested it. All right. So wine number three, This wine, again, bought at Sessie's shop. This wine is not a traditional, what you would think of as a traditional American Thanksgiving wine. Uh, this is the 2010 Tenuta Santonio Montegarbi uh, Valpolicello Superiore Ripasso. Yeah, a lot to say all at once. But hey, I already said it once, so I got the practice in. Uh, so let's talk about Valpolicella. Right, so Valpolicella is... Uh, from the Veneto area, oh, 15 bucks by the way, uh, is, is uh, from the Veneto area of Italy. Now that's the northeastern quadrant of Italy and where this wine and a lot of Valpolicellos are made, or they have to be made from this area, um, is near um, uh, Verona. I almost said Veneto, but that's east. Uh, Verona uh, and this winery is near Lake Garda. So, uh, the grapes that are typically used with Valpolicella are Corvina, uh, Rondinella, and also a grape called Molinara. Now, this particular wine uses those grapes plus, or it actually doesn't use, it uses, it uses Corvina and Rondinella, but the other ones that it uses are, um, survey says, bam. Nope, that's the wrong one. <laughs> is uh, Coravana, Coravina, uh, which is thought was was thought to be um, uh, the same grape as Corvina, and then no Valpolicella. Sorry, I didn't re bring up all of my web pages. And honestly, I thought I was going to remember this, um, but I didn't. Here we go. There we go. Uh, Coravone and Croatina and Ostaleta. Now, Cor Croatina and Ostaleta, Ostaleta uh, are considered minor grapes in the production of Valpolicella and Amarone, um, but they're used here. So they're not using the Molinara, which is fine. You know, they can do whatever they want. Um, but Corvina and Rondinelle are the main grapes that they're using here. Now, um, so what's the difference between this and uh, Amarone? So Amarone um, 
is a little bit higher end. It's a little more, uh, it, it's got a little more flavor to it. Um, but the same thing is happening with Amarone. You're drying out the grapes. So what we usually do is they, they put them on straw mats or they have them in these areas inside of a building, not like let's say a hot box but, or a sauna, but they let the, let the, the air pass through. So they dry out. Um, they're, they're laid out for three months um, for this. And they um, uh, allows the grape juice or allows the grapes to get concentrated in flavor. So they they press the wines or they they let the they let the grapes they let the grapes uh, uh, get the the first juice out the free run juice, and then you have you have uh, what's left over, and that's repassed, and that's put into the Valpola that's, that's combined with the Valpolicella. And that's where you get the Rapasso. So you're going to get extra concentration, a little bit extra tan, uh, tannins. So it, it's it's not a regular Valpolicella. That's just you know the the crushed grapes, and you get you know get the juices and all that. It's using the pomace is what it's called from the Amarone process, and they're adding it to it. So you're getting kind of an in between. I'm not going to say call it a baby Amarone, um, but you're getting a kind of an in between product. So um, the superiority just means that it's uh, higher in alcohol content than normal, uh, which normal is 12%. So, um, uh, and this is 14%. So you get a little bit, you have a little more concentration of sugars. Uh, it's fermented completely dry. So it's not a sweet wine. Um, Amarone can have a little bit of sweetness, even though it is uh, um, completely fermented. It might feel a little, it, it, it feels sweet, but it's technically not sweet. So let's check this out. Again, the wine. When I first did the wine, I, I sat there and said, I could smell this for days. I could smell this a lot. And, and, and it just keeps getting better. Like this wine, I cannot wait to try a little bit later tonight. We're having some friends over for dinner and um, I think it's gonna go great. It's gonna be a hit. So can't do too much more of this. But it, it's got, it, it's got all these great elements. I called it like, like smelling a candle, one of those scented candles, and even more so. I mean, I really now get the plum and the prune type of aroma out of it. Um, it's like walking into you know one of those candle shops or potpourri spice shops, uh, and getting all these all the all the spices and the, all those all those aromas from all these scented candles. It's, it's awesome. With a little bit of dust to it. I didn't get that the first time. A little bit of dust to it. So like an older shop, like an antique shop. So kind of dust and maybe a little, you know, old wood. Speaking of that, these are fermented in Slovenian oak instead of American or French, which is very typical for Italian wine. Um, they use a lot of Slovenian oak. I mean, it's, it's, it's a beautiful nose. I, it, it's hands down, of the three wines, my favorite wine, just so you know, it was my favorite wine. Still, it's, gonna, it's still looking like it's my favorite of the three. It tastes like it smells just even more so. I mean, it's smooth. Um, it's not heavily tannic, but it's got a little tannin to it. Um, it's really easy drinking. This wine is going to go with your heartier stuff. Um, it's also going to be something that, you know, it's really going to pair well with your cranberry sauce. Uh, if you're doing anything like that, it's still, it's still go great with ham. It's going to go maybe not so much with salmon and seafood, that type of thing. Uh, with the heartier like tuna or salmon, if you're going to do that for Thanksgiving, again, not you know not not normal, but it's really going to go well with that. If you if you're doing some steaks, if you're going to do prime rib, I think it'll go great with that. Especially if you're pairing it with a bunch of uh, flavors of spices, it's really really going to just enhance all of that. Um, if you get into the dessert realm, when if you're doing something that's got a lot of cinnamon or nutmeg or any of those types of spices to it, uh, I think. The Valpolicella is going to go great with that. Um, your lighter fare desserts, maybe not so much, but 
your heavier desserts, anything chocolate, it's gonna it's gonna taste like you know chocolate and 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 plum combination. It's gonna be awesome if you get like a chocolate cream pie or something like that. Um, with these two wines, like this one, the Godea, uh, if you're having like an apple pie, I think that'll go great. I think the like if there's some pumpkin pie or a pumpkin cheesecake, um, the Pinot Noir go great. Both these wines actually go great with that. Um, I got some good stuff, man. This is, this is, I mean, it ended up being a shorter episode because I had to do it again because I already, I didn't have to look at so much stuff and have to memorize anything. But, I mean, I, I had a lot of my thoughts already pre-made. But this wine, it, it, all the wines got better with time, but this wine just knocked it out of the park. If you can find it, do it. And, and, and here's the thing about this wine. I bought it for 15 bucks. Necessity says she got a great deal and this normally retails for about twice as much money. So this wine, if you're going to find it out there, might be closer to like 30 bucks. If you find it for under 30 or under 25, you get it for 15, buy it. I want to go back and buy more of this. And that's a rare thing for me to really, really feel like I want to go out and buy more of a wine that I've reviewed. Now I might say I, I'd like to have it again. If I see it again, I'd like to buy it. But in reality, the wines I drink at home are these wines. I don't have a lot of other drinking wine, but I have had some in the past. This, because it is reasonable, I can see buying a couple more bottles just to have around, just to say, hey, you know, I want some of that, um, ha you know, have some of the Valpolicella. Plus, you know, I've really grown fond of Valpolicella, even though I don't drink a lot of it. Every time I've had it, I've liked it. Yep. All right, so um, that's going to do it for this episode. Now, there's been a, there's been a, a, a long break in between episodes again. Um, just a lot of stuff. This year hasn't been the best uh, with trying to keep up with the production schedule. But um, we've got Christmas and New Year's coming up. I've got one more episode I'm recording today. Uh, that'll be the week after Thanksgiving. And then I have one more episode uh, that I've bought some wine already. Uh, and I've got the, the idea I need for that. So there might be like a week in December I won't have an episode. And that'll probably be my, what's probably going to be my traditional blog post of what I expect to do next year. Not necessarily a year in review, but it will talk about this past year and then talk about the goals for next year. So uh, look for that. And um, just, uh, just, a, a, just to kind of say it right now that next year I do expect, um, I expect to, to have a few goals in mind that are, not lofty, but pretty good goals that I uh, cannot wait to accomplish. So uh, next year is going to be yet another good year for uh, for Elite Wine TV. And I really appreciate everybody who stops by, watches it, wherever you watch it on Roku, if you're watching on the iFood uh, channel on Roku, uh, if you're watching it on Blip, you're watching it on the website, you're watching it on iTunes, you're watching it on, uh, on um, uh, TiVo, you know, however you're watching this, then keep watching it. Um, so if you're not watching any, if you're not watching it where there's revenue coming, like the ads, then stop by the website. First of all, stop by the website, click the links above to friend me up. I'm all over the internet. Um, and then if you're doing that, hit that little donate button that helps pay for the wine. And um, again, I really thank everyone for coming by and we'll see everyone again next time. Cheers.